Yeah, I remember after Trump got elected and mm. Richard Spencer got punched in the face and everyone was like, oh, is it like okay to punch Nazis? And I'm like, my grandfather's generation did not hand wring about whether it was okay to punch Nazis. I was also right? like, okay, you're fine with the bombing of Dresden, but punching a Nazi is too far. Yeah. Make it make sense. I mean, the bombing of Dresden was probably... No, I mean, I, I think that. the bombing yeah. of Dresden was probably too far, but you were kind of fine with it, historically. As they say, everything's bigger in America. Cars, burgers, medical bills. And you can probably stick conspiracy theories on that list too. When I was a kid, my mum had a hardback book that I couldn't get enough of. 100 of the world's greatest unsolved mysteries or something to that effect. And from Area 51 to the assassination of JFK, it felt like the rolling plains of the USA were a fertile meadow where all manner of weird stuff could happen the land of the free, and the home of the batshit. So what happens when the most powerful nation on earth, with 120 civilian guns for every 100 people, becomes gripped by paranoia? I can think of no one better to talk about this with than Nicky Wolf, which is lucky because he's joining me today. He's a journalist and editor, focusing on the sticky overlap between technology and politics, whose investigative podcasts have set a pretty high bar for what serialised audio can do. Finding Q, the product of a year-long investigation into QAnon, may have unmasked the man claiming to be a high-level operator in the American security services. Spoiler alert, he's not actually a spy. And his latest project, The Sound, the mystery of Havana Syndrome, is a deep dive into a spate of cases of a puzzling illness that afflicted US embassy staff in Cuba. We discuss radicalisation, spycraft and Marilyn Manson's rib. I hope you enjoy it. I love that era of like in the 90s where you suddenly get this ability for whether it's bands or TV shows like be in contact with mm. fans and like you know there's a special fan landline and like you know sometimes like you know Buffy herself will pick it up yeah and there's just this um like closing of distance which like I mm. don't know I was like a bit too young to participate in it at the time and I wish yeah and it, it was and then you got that era of the internet with the sort of live journal yeah. Like it was real. No one was broadcasting. It was all kind of closed communities. And then yeah. the internet shit itself all the way up the wall. But like, um, yeah, there was a golden age back then. Yeah. And I kind of, I think that in lots of ways, people are trying to like find ways to recreate it. Like I'm constantly talking to friends who are like, oh, I'm starting a newsletter just for my close mm. friends. And I'm like, you could just call me. Yeah. Yeah. Or it's just like go to the pub and like, yeah. Um, but I think I think there is something about people wanting to write. Like mm. I think that there is a human desire to do it. Completely, yeah. And then kind of Twitter comes along. It's like, here, let me turn that writing thing you like doing so much. And, you know, it's like yeah. freebasing. Do it for free, for, yeah, completely freebasing, exactly. I, like I've done like 50,000 tweets. Like that's, I could have written like five books, right? Oh like, my that's God. nuts. And you're just, you're just like. I'm doing it for free for this website that's now owned by the world's biggest company. And like, and I can't stop. Why the f I... And I can't stop. Yeah, because that tiny little dopamine receptor is like, but I like it when I see the heart go like right, this. Right. Oh yeah. God. Yeah. It's just brainworms everywhere. It, it like bypasses your own awareness. I mean, do you think you? This is way off topic. Do you think you'd make a good spy? No. Why? Well, just kind of broadcast everything all the time. <laughs> Although maybe there's kind of maybe that's a double block. I mean, if I was a good spy, no, is what I would say. Right? Yeah. I mean, I'd like share her. Mm -hmm. on, on all things, right? If I found something out as a spy, I would probably tweet it. So so what, what came first? Was it your fascination with American politics or your interest in technology? I've always loved America. It's a fascinating, it's, I mean, it's a completely bananas place, right? It's the cultural hegemon, everything runs through America. I don't know where like the future is going, but like for all of our lifetimes, America is, the rest of the world is sort of a follows America's lead, right? And that's and that sort of led me to technology in that the internet being Anglophone, you could also make an argument that a lot of the internet kind of original way it started working was also Japanese language, but largely the cultural impact of the internet has been English language. And then as it sort of spread, you know, I, I don't think it's necessarily a coincidence that like Brazil had its January 6th moment two years on from when um, America did. America had its like rise of fascism moment, and then it sort of spread. You got like Bolsonaro, you got um, Duterte, all of this kind of stuff happened almost 
to me, in in the network direction of internet penetration, right? Like it, it sort of spreads. And the, my operating thesis, this is so so miles off topic, this is my Go sort of it. manifesto, is that um, every time there's a new communications technology, you get a rise in populism attached to it. So, uh, like I'm not a historian, I've not any historian watching Printing this, press, like, printing press, right? Um, radio, Nazism, middle of the... You know, radio starts getting massive in between the 20s world and 30s. wars. Yeah. And then you get, like, the rise of Hitler, who used radio extremely effectively, right? And Mussolini, the kind of same thing. So that's my that's my kind of technological. And then that became so clear that was happening. By, by the 2016 election, you could see these communities being activated. And it all goes back to Gamergate. I think Gamergate set the cultural tone for how to wield that kind of troll power that before then had just been 4chan kind of messing with video games and I mean, things like that. Let's maybe like go into that a bit because my first encounter with 4chan, I guess, was I must have been about 15 or 16 and was dating a guy who was really into 4chan and anonymous because he saw it as a kind of crusading force for justice. Mm. And I at the time... Um, not much has changed, but I was a very earnest socialist and I was really against the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. And I didn't really understand why so much of his political energy was being captured by this thing when I was like, there's a there's a real war going on here and we can stop it if only you can distribute enough petitions at your sixth form. Um, and then I didn't really pay it any more attention again. Mm. And then Gamergate came along. And I was like, whoa, this thing which started out as being a kind of crusading force for justice and seemed to be really genuinely concerned by abuses of power within the Church of Scientology is now trying to hound Leslie Jones off the internet. Mm. What happened in between those periods of time? So um, so that, that Church of Scientology protest was the first story I ever covered right oh, really? so, so that was the first time I was sort of like and people were this was a student journalist and I turned up at this thing and actual people from the internet this is in York <laughs> right this is like an American internet thing there was a, a crowd of people outside Scientology who knew they had an office in York but like we turn up to them and people have actually turned up okay hang on what is the York Scientology thing so anonymous was this um hacktivist they were the first mm -hmm. kind of hacktivist group and um, they also came out of the 4chan ecosystem. And I think they've largely, especially in the early days, been on the side of the angels, right? So they, they at first took on the Church of Scientology. Um, I can't remember what it was that the church had done that first captured their ire. But the church was, you know, throwing its weight around, throwing legal money around. Anonymous got their sort of backs up about this and arranged this worldwide protest People turned up at hundreds of Scientology centers around the world from um, York, where I was, and I went and, and turned up and saw this like all across the US, across the rest of the world. My ex was at the Tottenham Court Road one. Really? So yeah, so yeah but, and um, that was the first time that I sort of thought to myself, oh, the, the internet has power to reach out beyond the internet and actually cause things to happen in real life. And that, so that was the moment I was like, okay, this is this is going to be the great... And that was 2007, 2008, right? We're talking kind of yeah. earlier days of the internet. And that was the moment where I, was, I sort of realized, oh, this is this is going to be the defining power structure of, of our age now. And everything has to interact with the internet now. And you're right, there was so much hope. And I think that hope has kind of maintained... Um, you know, there is still the power of the internet for change. Like, people still... I think their instinct was... There was a kind of social justice. The, the, the cat bin thing, right? The, the cat bin thing? One of the very early things on 4chan was that a CCTV video was released of, like, a lady literally putting a cat in a wheelie bin. Oh, right? yeah. Didn't she turn out to have a dying mother or something? So 4chan goes crazy because you do not fuck with... Like, 4chan Cats. will fuck with people as much as they want. Animals, 4chan has very, very strong feelings about. Um, and so within, and it was terrifying, within like, not even hours, they, had, they knew this, the address, they knew this person's name, they were like phoning her, they were phoning the police, everyone was, I was like, this is a very powerful 
weapon. And then Gamergate came along. And Gamergate was being watched very closely by Steve Bannon. And Steve mm-hmm. Bannon starts to figure out that this can be used as a weapon. There's a really good book about this called Devil's Bargain. And so what was Gamergate? Because what I understand about it, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, is that a lot of people are really angry about women. Yeah. Was that it? Yeah, basically. I mean, the internet lands extremely male, young, you know, dudes. There it was just sort of also the stirrings of the incel, mm-hmm. you know, misogyny is everywhere. And in this particular case, it it wormed its way into this community. Because um, these are, you know, these are shy kids. They're not, you know, a lot of them kind of being bullied in real life. They found this kind of power on the internet. And when a lot of, you know, young, lonely dudes get power, that's kind of inevitably going to be the way it, um, the way it kind of splashes out. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you started to get some really grim stuff. Like I, there was one where, because um, I sort of ended up covering this at The Guardian, um, where I watched, it, like there was a dude killed his girlfriend in real time, and really, really mm-hmm. bleak, and was like, and to, in some ways to 4 chance credit, they had tracked that down. Like they got the police there, heartbreakingly just too late but they mm. had done that you could there there's this thing on 4chan that's like something being true something being not the lines kind of blur because mm-hmm. everyone is larping everyone's kind of pretending to be something else and that's what how you LARPing up, for the unfamiliar like live action role play like pretending to be something and QAnon first came out of that mm-hmm. um which was someone pretending to be you know this government insider and there were loads of them around at the time and um then people start to take it seriously because poor chance it's all anonymous. You can't quite figure out what's true and what's not. Um, and then people, the idea is to trick people, right? So then, and the media is like getting getting a story in the papers. It's fucking pay dirt. <laughs> um, and yeah, and then it's sort of got taken over from that. Um, but it, it is that blending of pretending and tricking. How that, much does fantasy come into this because one of the things that really struck me when I was listening to your podcast Finding Q is that there was this element of LARPing which was about tricking people getting one over them and if you could get it into the mainstream media it's kind of like the greatest prank of all time but when I looked at the language of it which was about secrecy high stakes being chosen for a mission yeah. that you've got to do this really special thing it reminded me of when i was a kid and i was playing like pretend games and i remember me and my friends would be like and this really amazing thing it's about to happen to us and we'd be looking like a map of the world and I'm like and we have to flee to mauritius mm-hmm. um and it was just a way of constructing a story which made you feel thrilled yeah totally and it, it's it's that thing of playing a game with people where you're all sort of in on the joke and there's some people who aren't in on the joke. But yeah, it's it's almost analogous to Dungeons and Dragons, right? You're, you're with a group of people and you're telling a story together. Except in this case, there can be thousands and thousands of people and the story can take on a real shape in real life. This is, this is going to be another long walk, but one of the most interesting examples of this that I've ever seen was Slenderman. So Slenderman, which started out as this online horror in explicitly storytelling thing. It started out on a board that was like, make a spooky image. Someone made one that was extremely high quality. It was like pretending to be a library photo, like archive photo of like kids. And it's like, and you have to look at it for a really long time. And then in the background, you suddenly see it. And it just sends like chills down your spine, which is like great piece of horror, you know, creativity. And then it started to expand from there. People were kind of riffing on the mythos. And you had this, duality of some places in the internet and these were the same people in each sense in one part of it pretending the story is real you know talking as if like kind of spooky stuff and then there would be meta boards where they would discuss where to take the mythos and then in wisconsin um this school girl lured one of her friends into the woods and like stabbed her 15 <laughs> times and it, it, unbelievably lucky she, luckily she was okay oh, wow. in the end but the Slenderman kind of community was like, oh, fuck, have we actually summoned some kind of, de- like in almost a literal sense, they thought they'd made this demon thing real. They were terrified. 
Have you ever been taken in by a piece of internet misinformation or a prank or a hoax? Yeah, I think everyone has. There, there's no, no one is above being tricked by this. And these are often very, very creative people with extremely good, you know, from Photoshop skills to everything like that. Um, but yeah, I think everyone's been taken in by something at some point. Um, whether it's someone contacting a journalist with like, oh, I got a tip and they're, you know, and you've got journalists, I think in general, have to learn really, really early on how to triage information. This sort of, I mean, that's what journalists should be doing all the time, right? Should be. Should Very be. big should be. But often because of the way the industry works, there just isn't time. You know, you've got to, you've got two hours to turn a story around from, from commission to thing. And sometimes you can get tricked because these are people with a lot of time on their hands but whose whole aim is to trick you. There's also ideological incentives, right? I mean, I was thinking about this, must have been a week or two ago, and there was a story which the Daily Mail was covering. And it was about trans rights groups want Aretha Franklin's, you know, you make me feel like a natural woman to be banned by Spotify because it's offensive to trans people. And immediately I read through it and I was like, that's a parody account. That's got mm. all of the marks of a parody account. Yeah. And the Daily Mail did a story. Piers Morgan is tweeting about it being like, oh, these woke wastrels. And I was like, well, hang on. Basic media literacy tells me this is a parody yep. account and yet it's being taken up as a serious story and nobody is embarrassed by the fact that it's so flimsy because they've moved on to the next thing and because it fits the culture war narrative there's there's a huge example of this at the moment which is this idea that fentanyl u.s cops are kind of there's this whole scare thing about fentanyl oh yeah fentanyl's is, like kryptonite right the, this idea that you can touch it which is like not how anything works <laughs> That, that's not that's not how drugs work. You can't like touch the outside of a pill and get an overdose of it. Like that's just not. And and you get the same thing every Halloween with you know people are putting drugs in. You know we've seized all of this candy that people are getting to kids and it's fentanyl. It's like no fentanyl dealer is giving them away to children. That's your fucking merchandise. But this story continues because it's especially for sort of local TV news. It's an easy scare. Fear is a very good driver of traffic. Um, and it's easier to not check, right? Too good to check. I mean, so how has the internet changed the spread of conspiracy theories? Somebody tweeted something the other day, which I found hilarious, and it was also really insightful, which is how did all of us, before the internet, hear that Marilyn Manson rib rumour? Like, Oh my what, God, yeah. What was, <laughs> how did that happen without the internet? Um, because obviously there have been conspiracy theories, there have been legends and rumours mm before the internet, but that's changed somehow. So could you maybe shed a bit of light on that? It's about the ecosystem itself, right? The, what the internet did was just flatten everything and spread everything, like butter on toast. Everything's everywhere. But information still flowed before. People, it was just people talking about it in, you know, school common rooms or texting about it. Christ, I'm so old. <laughs> Texting about it. Do you remember when SMSs used to always SMSs. charge by the character? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then it would get on TV and, and news, but I don't even think that was really covered in, in media. It was just an urban legend. Mm. But yeah, how did urban legends just spread through people to people? Mm. And kind of always have. It's just now that spread of people to people is instantaneous and exponential. So like you, you tweet one thing, it's not just texting it to one mate who then texts it to maybe three who texts it to three, which is still a fast spread. Now it's one person to a thousand to ten thousand to everyone, and it just it can explode so fast. I mean, you discussed this connection between new forms of communications technology and populism. Um, not not just the internet as a whole, but how the different platforms had almost their own conspiracy theory. Um, is it different from platform to platform? What I think made 4chan so perfect for this kind of thing was that it was the combination of anonymity. There's no accounts. You can post as anything. You can post as anyone. Ephemerality, which is that a post survives while people are engaging with it and then drops off and disappears. Um, and community, which is that they had people on there who were explicitly using that as a system. So 4chan became core to all of this. But that kind of anonymity was a big part of the early internet. We're, we're so used to everything being within apps and you have your account, but you used to be able to just post whatever you whatever you want, whenever you, I mean, you still can post whatever you want, but now it's siloed. 
and I, I don't think it's controlled. I don't think it's regulated. You know, you still get enormous amounts of hate speech, obviously, on on places like Twitter. But it's monetized. The incentive structure for platforms is engagement, and so you're always engaging with a platform as well as with people on these things, which is which was just not the case in in the earliest days of the internet. What do you think that the media gets wrong when covering internet stories? Oh, almost everything. I mean, it, <laughs> it's it's tough to. It's tough for journalists who, because a story should be people doing a thing, and this is its effect. And the internet is almost, uh, you almost have to consider it, especially places like 4chan, as a kind of a a being in its own right. It acts as one, which was going back to that Scientology protest. You know, people, it this internet thing had, had reached out and was doing things. Each Each person was just a node in a wider... And but it's worth saying that's sort of how a political movement mm. works. It's organic. I was going to say that's like you know Becky Bond's rule for, rules for revolutionaries, mm. like a theory of organizing, right there. Yeah, it's it's organizing, but without organizing, there's there's mm. no head of it. It's just riffing, um, but it comes up with directions almost on its own, which is terrifying in some ways, but amazing in, in other ways. Um. So so. How do you get from riffing to neo-Nazism? I mean, this is the thing. <laughs> this is the thing I'm really oh. interested in, which is why is it so often when you've got a libertarian space um, that it very quickly goes from I want to be offensive and I want to be shocking mm. to Hey, did you know there's a master race and we're it? Um, because it's always been there, right? That that's always been where where you have conspiratorial thinking, which which everyone everyone has a conspiracy theory that they're um, you know, from Avril Levine's been replaced by a body double, Avril Levine's been replaced by a body double, it's been that case for ages. Um <laughs> Melissa. Isn't her name Melissa, the yeah. body double? Yeah, yeah. Um but from that to and and you know, the protocols of the elders of Zion have been around mm-hmm. for ages, that almost spread in that same organic way. People were printing it Samizdat, handing it around. Um there is always an instinct to think that there is some kind of shady power that goes on behind the scenes and is controlling everyone's lives. Then you have a separate problem, which is that it is healthy to have a skepticism for power. Um, it just is really difficult to harness it in the right way that gets um, that gets to the actual truth rather than it just sort of spinning its wheels and and not really getting anywhere except abusing some I mean, you know, I mean random th- kid. This is the this is the thing that which I really wanted to get into is that there are conspiracies. Cons- yeah. Conspiracies oh, yeah. are real. Um, you know, from the Iran Contras affair to the replacement of Avril Levine by a body double. <laughs> um, you know, these things happen. And particularly right. when you're talking about America, the state has been up to an awful lot of shady shit. Um, yeah. states are not honest with you. They lie to you. So do you think that there is some element of shared responsibility here? That if governments didn't lie so much, populations wouldn't be so susceptible to conspiracy? Governments are always going to lie, right? That's that's just what is part and parcel of... Like, show me a, a government that completely doesn't lie is not a government that's going to survive very long because they'll be replaced by a party without as many scruples. I think that's just a fundamental... P, like power wants to survive again with the QAnon thing, and actually, even before that goes satanic panic. This is another um, really regular feature of, of conspiracy theories and conspiracy ecosystems going back time immemorial. Is um, the kind of quote unquote you know pedophiling, mm. right? Like it's it's just the easy because it's the worst thing you can imagine, and you'd project that onto the group that you're. But there was one, right? Yeah. Like Jeffrey Epstein. There, there literally was a child sex abuse ring at the highest echelons of power, which makes it really difficult to... There, there's a way of covering conspiracy theories where you go in and you sort of blanket, you know, disregard everything that also doesn't work because sometimes there are kind of conspiracies. Mm. And sometimes the, the conspiracy is right out in the open, right? The January 6th in the US, 
was a a literal conspiracy to overthrow the the US government, right? And we've seen that coming through in all of the hearings. It was just happening in public. You know, he was just <laughs> tweeting it. He was saying, like, we're going to rush the capital today. It's like so, you can't identify the signal for the noise. Right, exactly. And that's what the internet has done. It's just there's the, the baseline noise is so loud that by the time something like January 6th comes around, it's it's sort of too late. And I, and I think what um, a lot of people try and do is overcorrect, which is to say... Um, Oh, you know, they're like this. As if there's still norms in politics, right? <laughs> there haven't been norms in politics ever. Like, no one is... This, from, you know, the American founding fathers mm. um, through to, you know, the, the governments in World War II, or, or whatever, like, name any era in history <laughs> and you'll find people trying to overturn norms for their personal gain. Well, the thing I found really funny is I was once discussing this with um, Rory Stewart, who mm. was talking about a present era as being one of um, historically unprecedented norms collapse and, you know, anti-democratic and really bad. And I was like, okay, so when was your golden era of parliamentary right. democracy? He was like, the 19th century. And I was like, you meant when, you mean when women couldn't vote? Yeah, it, all of this stuff. Like, there, there never was, there's never been a golden age. There's just power and people trying to hold on to power. And that's, that's just a fact of, of humanity, right? I mean, so looping... Oh, this sounds like a horrible sentence to utter. Looping back to paedophilia for a second. <laughs> um, I mean, my, my, just circle back, yeah. Just, just circling back to the whole um, child abuse thing. Um, everyone in my family works in social services, by the way. So the nature of dinner table conversation was sort of like, oh, I was working on this case of horrendous abuse yesterday. Yeah, the paperwork was insane. Um, <laughs> because that was their job. Mm. Um, is there a kind of irony here or an internal contradiction that Chan boards have also been a hotbed for images of child sexual abuse yeah. whilst also at the same time being animated by this moral crusade against you know satanic ritual abusers or you know the QAnon theory of you know child sacrifice and pedophilia being endemic within the mm. democrats like what's that about I think because it's everyone. It, it's it's a slice cross section of, of all of humanity. So it, it contains multitudes, right? Like it, there's um, always the. God, it's really difficult to find phrasing around this that doesn't yeah. sound like ridiculous. There's always like there's always going to be pedophiles, right? There's always going to be, um, and there's always going to be anger and crusades. But the fact that it's all happening within the same ecosystem. It's always happened within the same ecosystem because the just the ecosystem before was and remains just humanity. It's just this weird window in it that the internet allows that you can you can see this humanity, the you know the good and the evil playing out in sort of the same time. But is is there also a thing about because the the innocence of children and the desire to protect them is an absolute? It is a moral absolute. It means that if you tell a story of that innocence being violated, um, yeah. anything is justifiable. And I was thinking about this with the kind of anti-LGBT. Yeah, but the drag moral queen, panic. the the drag story hour in the US is you they you project the evilest thing you can onto the group that you're trying to marginalise. But and and you get this with a lot of kind of the the American right especially, is there, there was there's an amazing video of an interview that happened quite recently where the guy is like, um, yeah, the Democrat Party is overwhelmed with paedophiles. And the journalist is like, so I've got your, your rap sheet here and you spent five years in jail for uh, abusing a minor. And the guy's like, yeah, but, you know, the Democrats. And it's like... I mean, that's a level of cognitive dissonance, which is utterly, dissonance. utterly... Um, insane i mean there's also a really long history theory of conspiracy theories being uh founded on they're coming for your children in some yeah. way so anti-semitic blood libel conspiracy theories mm -hmm. are about jewish people are coming yeah. for your children um and, I mean, and probably you know if you go back to you know the assyrians that have been you know mm. whatever or like the roman empire they would have still been it's it's just an easy way of calling someone Bad, othering, um, um, but that's not to say that it's also not a thing that happens. It's just not necessarily 
the the people who wield that as a um, as an attack are often also doing it. I think. I'm not sure um, what you think the first conspiracy theory is, but I know what I think the first conspiracy theory is. The first one ever. I think it might be, I mean, well, obviously Jesus was a big old victim of a conspiracy theory, (laughs) now that I think about it. Um, But in the Canterbury Tales, you have as one of the stories, I believe being told by the nun or the abbess, I can't remember, um, about a, a good Christian child who keeps whistling a hymn. And then, you know, the very naughty Jews, like, you know, come and slaughter him. And then there's effectively a pogrom. Mm -hmm. Um, And the kind of ghost or the spirit of this whistling child, like, you know, haunts uh, the Jews forevermore. And I was like, oh, this is a kind of classic um, moral panic centered around, you know, the innocence of child. And it's, you know, going back to one of the earliest, um, you know, parts of the English literary canon. Like, it's right there. Yeah, completely. And um, I, I would imagine it goes back as far as, and yeah, as, as long as there have been human beings, way back, you know, hunter-gatherer era, there will have been a group of hunter-gatherers who are like, this other group of hunter-gatherers is trying to control our lives. Like th- this idea um, that a way of taking power for yourself is to scapegoat mm. a group. It's as old as humanity, right? I mean, we've been talking a bit about like what happens to the scapegoated, but what happens to you as the participant of a conspiracy movement or a moral panic? I mean, in Finding Hugh, you talked to quite a lot of people who'd been caught up in it. What was the impact like on their lives? They are um, just sort of cogs in the machine, right? And it's it's a radicalization, in, uh, and I think I draw the parallel with being radicalized, say, into something like ISIS. Mm. There's elements of repetition, there's elements of isolation that a radicalization process involves. It's just that the internet has made that so much, first of all, so much easier and also organic. You you find yourself in these communities and that's the only truth and you're being told, don't trust anyone else, which is another big part of how this kind of thing happens. Um, and you, you just fall into that and everyone is vulnerable to that. Everyone can uh, end up being radicalized into a group given the right circumstances. It's not, there's no type of person that's that's vulnerable. Because I mean, there, there is there a stereotype, more... right? Which is like Facebook, boomer, low media literacy. Mm. But was that not the case? Certainly Facebook has made it easier to radicalize boomers. Like the, the structures do that. But, you know, these could be your parents, right? Like these are not necessarily, um, there's a, a feeling that it's sort of weak-minded individuals it's not. It could be anyone. Anyone. It's just that Facebook made that kind of organic structure, and and on purpose, right? Mm. Like fear and anger are the biggest drivers in, of engagement. So they wanted to create that. Like posts that were causing anger were better for Facebook because they're they're better for any um, platform. I mean, one of the ways in which these platforms work, and I notice it with myself, particularly on Twitter is that my compulsion to use the app has bypassed my user awareness. Mm -hmm. Um, Is there a way for people to regain control over that? Or do you think that the regulation has to be on the supply side rather than self-control on the demand side? I mean, you can't regulate on the demand side of Mm. of content, right? I mean, before you start banning people from reading certain things, which at that point that point just confirms the the conspiracy right like that what what that would be is essentially um policing what people can and and you get that problem if you're regulating the supply side mm. as well you get, you know you're controlling what people can read so it's a really difficult question um and i don't necessarily think governments are particularly interested mm. in this because if you certainly look at the us republican party who remember control the House of Representatives now, this is a powerful base for them. It's in their interest to continue this. I mean, yesterday, Marjorie Taylor Greene, Marjorie Taylor fucking Greene, was sat in the Speaker's chair as Speaker pro tem. Like, this Mm. is amalgamated into the American government. I mean, that's wild. Okay, Marjorie Taylor Greene, give us um, the quick rundown, her CV. So she is, she's probably the most prominent 
QAnon Republican in the movement. She's trying to maneuver herself to be the heir, her and Matt Gates, um, and Matt Gates is more just kind of straight out, just general horrible rather than QAnon horrible. Um, I actually crashed Marjorie Taylor Greene's victory party. She, she's, I think, the most conservative district in um, in the country. Her district in Georgia goes Republican by seventy percent, something insane like that. So she wow. she won the nomination. Uh, she was once she won the nomination, she was going to Congress. She once claimed that there was a um, gay Jewish space laser. Like she, there was no We've conspiracy. We've got one of those. I know. Yeah, and and it's it's wonderful. I love firing the gay Jewish space <laughs> laser. But she is the best example, I think, of someone who um, is on that edge. I I've been covering Marjorie Taylor Greene um, since I you know for four years now. I don't know how much she truly believes in this stuff versus how much she is cynically harnessing this stuff. It's it's that cognitive dissonance, and it's entirely possible that it's both. Mm. Um, but, yeah, she is a rising star Republican politician. Um, she was acting – she was speaker pro tem the day before yesterday. She was sat in the speaker's chair. She, she is now the, other than Trump, leading – um, QAnon conspiracy, uh, conspiracy theorist in the US, which is terrifying. And she is she's a demagogue. She's um, of the far right. There is no far right cause that she won't latch herself onto, um, whether it's abortion or guns or any of this sort of stuff. Great replacement. She gave a big great, great replacement. replacement speech. Yeah. She is, um, imagine if like Oswald Mosley was also extremely dumb. Imagine if Oswald Mosley also had split ends. Right, right. Yeah, she's she's dumbest timeline Oswald Mosley, basically. <laughs> I mean, there's there's been a connection between these uh, conspiracies, whether it's Pizzagate or QAnon or The Great Replacement, and horrendous acts of violence. Mm-hmm. I mean, would you go as far as to say it's a form of stochastic terrorism? It's pumping oh, out completely. information, yeah. which makes violence more likely. And, except it's it's pumping out information, but it's hard to identify the stochastic terrorist mm. as it were there's people latching themselves onto it and and riding it but it's it's difficult to see one person there's no kind of mastermind saying we are going to create this conspiracy theory it will allow us to control people mm. it happens organically slash was already there to start with but can then be signal boosted and and used and and that's the same for you know, from things like ISIS to things like MAGA republicanism, there's there's a fear and an anger latent in a population, and that's very easy to to wield. Do you think that the UK right has learned any lessons from the US right? Do you see any seeds yeah. of that kind of MAGA culture here? Certainly people are trying, right? There's, um, in some ways I've been... God, I can't believe I'm about to say this. Relatively patriotic feeling <laughs> recently in that, you know, the last what, seven years of, of British government hasn't, or however long, it's not been fantastic, right? It's been a complete clusterfuck. Our disaster has not involved nearly as many actual Nazis as the as the American one, right? Like, mm. Americans, they're not, the Republicans aren't even pretending anymore. Uh, you know, the Tories are hapless and venal and but you know I, I don't get the feeling they actually want to start rounding people up and putting them into camps which is something that oh give Suella time <laughs> <laughs> oh Suella I mean Jesus Christ Suella Bravo. It's, it's still it's wild to me that she is she would fit neatly within the American mm. Republican Party but not near the top of the most you know I mean, it was it was interesting to me during that time where Brexit had kind of stalled through Parliament and you did have a lot of the far right around Westminster. Um, and myself and Owen Jones got like chased through a couple of times and they were wearing, you know, make Britain great again caps. And it was an attempt mm. to start a kind of MAGA movement. But then as soon as Boris Johnson passed Brexit, it went away. They didn't have anything to sustain themselves anymore. And it mm. went from being a really uh, f- frightening time. And I was genuinely, during that general election, worried that something was going to happen to me or happen to Owen or one mm. of my friends, um, to relative stability again. What, why do you think that Britain 
hasn't had a kind of like of um, far right conspiracism in the same way that the US has. Are we just are we more discerning as a culture? I think there's a small C conservatism to Britain that makes it harder for that kind of thing to take hold. Um, yeah, it's 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 hard to know. I mean, it, it's like even you look back as far as you know Mosley and the and the mm. BUF and them not catching on in the UK in the way that they did in. He got punched in the face and he got punched Road. in the face. I know, in in a way that like. Um, you know, remember after Trump got elected and mm. Richard Spencer got punched in the face and everyone was like, oh, is it like okay to punch Nazis? And I'm like, my grandfather's generation did not hand ring about whether it was okay to punch Nazis. I was also right? like, okay, you're fine with the bombing of Dresden, but punching a Nazi is too far. Yeah. Make it make sense. I mean, the bombing of Dresden was probably No, I mean, I, I like think that. the bombing yeah. of Dresden was probably too far, but you were kind of fine with it historically. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, we fought a war against... but. There hasn't been a sort of British Nazi movement since then, because I think there is a tradition here of anti-fascism. Um, there's a tradition in the US of anti-fascism as well. Like Portland, for some reason, has become this kind of mm. running battle. It's fascinating how that's that's where the, you know, Nazis go to march, and it's where kind of Antifa meets them, and there's these clashes. Um, there's a great podcast I listen to on this called uh, Rob Evans. Mm. Uh, Robert Evans, who, who kind of covers this, um, and is out every... You know, every night, and I'm and I'm like, yeah, more of more mm. of that, more like Nazis should be afraid to march in the street. That doesn't seem like a controversial thing to say, right? Like Nazis should be afraid. No, That's, I'm fine with that. I'm fine with yeah. the Nazis afraid again. Um, I mean, moving on a bit, can you tell me the story of Havana Syndrome? Right. So this this goes completely the other way because I'm having done the key thing of you know covered the internet and conspiracy theories. I was um, starting out on this project to not quite so explicitly but like to debunk Mm -hmm. this idea so in havana in 2016 um american diplomats we now know the first at least five were cia officials started getting mysteriously sick and they had dizziness nausea trouble sleeping trouble thinking and they'd all heard this weird sound had any of them taken ketamine um i don't know maybe I'm just, I'm not saying. I, it's, so, um, yeah, imagine being on ketamine, but, like, having that that tipping point where you've had just too much ketamine, but, like, all the time, and, like, for mm. the rest of your, like, is these people are very seriously disabled now for, you know, for life. It's, it's awful. It comes out in um, summer of 2017. Um, it goes public. The U.S. State Department says that some kind of sonic weapon sonic energy device was being used. The FBI sent in a massive investigation team. They don't find any evidence for this. CIA starts doing its own secret investigation. State Department commissions an investigation. All these investigations come to wildly different conclusions. So the theories include the... And and as this is going on, more and more people start reporting this. So the first cohort of Havana is 24 Americans, 15 Canadians there. There have been spikes in Vienna, spikes in um, Hanoi, spikes in Guangzhou. Um, it sort of spreads around the world. And so I'm brought in to look into like, what the hell happened. The theories include that it's a sonic device, that it's some kind of directed energy weapon of another kind, um, that it's psychogenic, which was where I my kind of instinctive starting point was the power of suggestion on the human brain is really strong. It's, and so, like, psychogenic used to be called, like, mass hysteria. Right. And obviously hysteria is not the, the term that's used um, today. Yeah, because that's, that's really just saying that the womb did it. Right. Exactly. So the mass mass psychogenic event or mass delusion event. Um, but in researching this, it kind of, to my shock and terror, became clear that, especially in that first instance, that just didn't fit. The first few cases didn't know about each other. So there was no opportunity for psychogenic transfer. Some of the symptoms that were being described are not things that a psychogenic event can cause. So like, you know, it can cause headaches, it can cause dizziness. It can't make you bleed out your eyes, right? Mm. Like that's that's just sort of not. Um, and then also studies were starting to find evidence of brain damage in some of these patients. Brain imaging studies are iffy because they were just taking a scan of the brain. They didn't have a before picture. So in slightly fudging it when they said damage. 
especially in that first study. But there have now been, I think, four brain imaging studies, all of which have come to the same conclusions, including one by uh, the Canadians. So it just became this huge mystery. Um, and yeah, I started looking into it. First, the, the other victim in all of this is the Cuban people, mm. because the Trump administration, this is very early days, they were at first blaming the Cubans. So they rolled back on all of Obama's opening up the Cuban economy. We, we went to Havana um, late last year. We were talking to people who, you know, put their life savings into an Airbnb. Because as soon as Obama mm. opened up things in 2015, you know, people started, um, you know, opening little Airbnbs, little restaurants. Mm. And then at the bigger end, people were building these ginormous hotels, a huge cruise ship dock. And then the Trump administration in 2017 wipes all that out. They put Cuba back on the state sponsor of terror list. And the Cuban economy goes into free fall. I mean, we were there, we were paying for things in bricks of cash. Like, it, mm. it's huge inflation. Everyone between age, 18 and 40 is either leaving or trying to leave. We were hearing about hospitals using cardboard for um, casts because they can get the materials. Mm. Um, yeah, it's it's been terrible on that front. And then you have all these victims. Um, and we're, we're hearing a lot, like, people... Um, who say they've been civilian victims of this, that's much harder to look into and wasn't sort of where we started off. Um, but we, I wanted to start off from a position of kind of open mind, despite having the, the psychogenic kind of thing in my head. Um, so if it's not psychogenic, it kind of leads you towards there's something in the natural environment that's causing right. it or there's something which is man-made. So wh where do you end up landing, can I so ask? The natural environment hypothesis would include, so people have done some recordings of the sound, and this is the thing that that unites all of these cases is that they've heard this weird sound. Um, so they looked into it, they heard that crickets were making a, a similar sound that was recorded, but crickets can't call this, these symptoms. Mm -hmm. There was... Um, like some kind of toxin or um, something like that. It was thought that it might have been some kind of mosquito spray, mm -hmm. but the patients all had blood work. Nothing was um, discovered in there. Um, and then the attack hypothesis, one of which is sort of sonic, ultrasound, infrasound, which are the top and bottom ends of the spectrum, mm -hmm. both of which can cause some damage and, and exist already. There's sort of uh, on the top end of the audible spectrum you've got ultrasound which you can get a thing that you plug in that sends out an ultrasound signal that deters rodents and, and insects mm -hmm. right and you know when you're pregnant you have an ultrasound mm -hmm. like these this, that technology is exists and then infrasound which is this amazing guy called vladimir gavro in the, mm -hmm. in the 50s who was trying to make this infrasonic weapon and david bowie became obsessed with the idea of the black noise mm. um the problem is both infrasound and, and infrasound and ultrasound Ironically, you wouldn't be able to hear. They're outside the range. So this, the fact that people had heard this sound, ironically, rules out a sonic weapon. Okay. Um, that and the thing Vladimir Gavro built, the black noise machine, was fully 75 foot long, required like five generators. Um, so we sort of end up looking at pulsed microwave frequency, which was something that, that people have posited early. And the evidence for that is, first of all, there's this thing called the Frey effect. Mm -hmm. which pulsed microwaves can cause the experience of a sound without going through the ears because like, it causes tiny temperature changes in the brain that causes a wave to reverberate inside the skull and, and affects the inner ear. So you, and one thing that a lot of the Havana syndrome original cohort described was being able to step in and out almost like it's a beam and the sound stops and, and starts again. So that was a point of evidence in that favor. And then the next question of the, after that is... Uh, is it plausible? Does it does it fit? Um, well, no. The first question is: Is it is it possible? Mm -hmm. So we actually we built one, um, and we were able to project a, a beam of um, of microwaves and sort of detect it some meters away mm -hmm. out of cannibalized household parts, right? Um, and then we looked into the um, how spread it is in the mm -hmm. American and in, in the world kind of defense industries, and it turns out we found that there are several American defense companies. They make devices explicitly to to do something like this. So the devices exist. Um, we've heard from one source that they are being deployed actively by certainly the US and that Russia and China had had mm -hmm. similar kind of development projects. Um, and then the plausibility, like did it fit with the way people were describing? So we looked at the people stepping in and out of the beam. Um, what kind of 
symptoms they had, and that's within the, the possibility that these devices describe, and it's actually within the, the brochures that the American defense companies, uh, you know, advertise internally that these devices can do. So to to our shot, we land on the, I think, I think at least in the core of it, I think, you know, at least in Havana, and I think in a, a couple of the other spikes, um, that there was some kind of pulsed radio frequency or microwave device deployed. And then we looked a little bit further into it, and there's loads of these around, you know, like loads of countries have this. Um, and so, and this is where it starts to sound literally conspiratorial. Mm-hmm. The, these devices are being, it, it's possible that each of these spikes was done by a, a different national actor and that some of them might be psychogenic, some of them might be real. Obviously, when it's in the public consciousness, mm. it's really difficult to unpick what might be psychogenic from what might be real. But certainly, these devices exist and um, have been deployed at So do spikes. you have a theory for who? Are you now settling on multiple um, mm. nationalities, security services, um, the, the, or... the nationality that, that obviously has form in doing things like this is Russia. We, they've been, um, it turns out, using various kinds of microwave energy against U.S. diplomats since as far back as the as the 60s. Um, we spoke to people who'd served in the U.S. Embassy in Moscow in the 70s, who it, it wasn't even secret that the U.S., that the, the Russians were bathing the Americans in, in microwave radiation. And in that case, it was to activate passive listening devices. Um, but it had health effects on um, the diplomats going back that far. By the kind of 90s and early 2000s, that had sort of evolved. We spoke to um, the head of, um, I think, counterintelligence at the US Embassy in Moscow um, in the uh, 90s to early 2000s. He was like, yeah, again, like the Russians were messing with this in all kinds of ways. Um, we know that they've got it. We know that they've got the... Um, that they've done this sort of thing in the past um, and that they had an interest in um, intimidating American diplomats. And if that was their intent, it's been quite successful. You know, CIA and State Department are struggling to fill overseas roles, especially people with families because, you know, kids have been hit by mm. this. Um, so if if it was that, and there's a lot of circumstantial evidence that it was, and in that kind of awkward way, a lot of uh, background and off-record evidence mm-hmm. that sort of, and in my head, strengthens that conclusion for us. Russia is the, just the obvious candidate. And I mean, they've they've assassinated, what, 18 people on mm. UK soil in the last kind of 20 years? Like, they're, Russia fucks around, right? Mm. And, and we're now, during a, a land war in um, Eastern Europe, in which Russia, like, Russia does this kind of thing. But mm. also, um, it's possible that some of the other attacks might be by other national actors as well. The um, the Vienna attack was during the Iran deal negotiations. Um, so immediately we thought, like, oh, could Iran mm-hmm. be involved in that? We spoke to some um, national security sources and don't think so because mm-hmm. it was in Iran's – they wanted this deal to mm-hmm. go through. But Russia didn't want it to go through. So that was another kind of point. Guangzhou, which is one of the main mm-hmm. – one of the big spikes – very difficult to imagine Russia can operate on Chinese soil without mm. China knowing about it, right? So there's all kinds of different um, kind of angles going on in terms of who the culprit might be. Um, but we're pretty confident we have the method and we're pretty confident we have, the suspect has the the motivation. What's it like interacting with people who are or were part of the security services? Terrifying. Really? Because, I mean, I... I have spent a lot of my career looking at the kind of terrifying face of, you know, digital experience, extremism, right? So I was sort of de facto mass shooter correspondent for a while, like reading those manifestos, watching that kind of stuff play out live within these communities online. The national security establishment is the complete opposite end of the spectrum from that, right? Like they, a lot of these security forces operate with impunity a lot of them, without even... One of the things that, that really stood out is that the FBI doesn't really talk to the CIA. The CIA doesn't really talk to the State Department. I mean, the CIA is its own fiefdom, mm. right? They, we had one uh, source at the State Department who was basically like, I personally suspect the CIA knows what's going on, but we'd be the last person they'd tell, right? They, they, all of these 
groups are in their own private stuff. They're kind of head to head with, and like again, the, one of the people that Russia assassinated on on British soil. And there's this fantastic book a friend of mine wrote, um, Heidi Blake, um, from Russia with Blood, talking about mm. these assassinations. One of them's literally an MI6 agent, turned up in a in a bath in a hotel room in a bag. Oh yeah, and then they. I remember listening to this news story because it happened, I think, when I was in my teens. Mm. It must have been. Yeah, and yeah. This was two thousand and six, something, something like, like that. that. Because I remember listening to it and being really struck by the homophobia of mm. the news coverage because they said that because he was gay or was accused of being gay that it was a sex game gone wrong mm. so that's how he got himself into a suitcase and then that police ruled it, it a suicide died. but Heidi in this in this book demonstrates that, that that was a Russian um operation and obviously you've got the high profile ones like Litvinenko um Salisbury Salisbury Russia has this form of doing this kind of thing so how do you again it's this thing of making room for actually existing conspiracy theories without slipping into conspiracism because there is amongst liberals and progressives a tendency to use russia to explain everything mm -hmm. from the origins of QAnon to brexit to the rise of trump russia becomes the explanation for here are things we don't like how do you walk a line mm. between talking about Russian security practices and also not veering into, um, you know, Russia ate my hamster. In in some ways it's easier in a national security reported story because it's much less, uh, do they want to, you know, put a thumb on the scale a little bit, unclear how much, like obviously MAGA and, and Trump is a, a U.S., phenomenon without Russia doing anything that still happens in a national security story like Havana syndrome they either did it or they didn't mm. right that someone if someone is pointing a ray gun someone's holding the trigger of that ray gun right mm. it's, it's a demonstrable yes or no um and so almost like a court case you sort of marshal the arguments and you say this is um means motive opportunity and you see what comes out of that um and it's, I think, probably useful for me coming as a conspiracy theory reporter to be able to come with the, the skepticism of saying this, that there's a really high bar of proof there that you've got to hit. Um, you've got to be pretty certain about it. Otherwise, you are just sort of risking falling into that conspiratorial thinking. Um, we do strongly think it's Russia. We, we strongly think um, at least the Havana incident was, and that's partly because... Um, we've looked into Russia's weapons development. They certainly have the means. Um, they love fucking with Western security forces. They certainly have the motive. Um, and especially since this was happening in a few years before Ukraine, but certainly while mm. Russia was thinking about its ambitions, I think it was just before Crimea. Mm. Um, and then third, actually, when the hell was Crimea? Uh, Crimea was 24. 2014. So just afterwards. Mm. Um, and the opportunity, um, and certainly Havana and Vienna, there's lots of Russian historical activity going back. We know that they've done all kinds of things in those two places. Before Cuban Missile Crisis, you go back to as far as um, Havana goes, Vienna's always been kind of spy capital. Mm. Um, and then you just have to find sources that you trust who know what they're talking about, listen to them, check what they're saying see if it fits. I mean, uh, one of the things that really struck me listening to these podcasts back to back, Finding Q and Havana Syndrome, was it clarified some of the differences for me between Britain and America. Hmm. And one of the things that really explains it is the way in which American political culture and the kind of collective hive mind has been shaped by both the Cold War and evangelical hmm. Christianity. Yeah. Um, it's a country that sees itself, this is a, like a gross oversimplification, but mm. if I were to sort of summarize America, it is a country that's, that sees its narrative part in the world in, in very black and white terms, in sort of good versus evil. Um, you know, they see themselves as the rebel alliance from Star Wars. Um, <laughs> and it's like, without, no, in, Guata, in Guatemala, you were Darth Vader. Right. I mean, the Bay of Pigs, right? The CIA funded, 
you know, an, an attempted overthrow of the Cuban government. The CIA also has a long history mm. of, of doing these things, which is why we also think, and we have a, a very good source who told us this, that America not just has these devices, but has deployed them in the field in the past. Um, but yeah, in both of those instances, they they see themselves in this way. They see everything America. It's this American exceptionalism mm. thing, right? They see nothing by definition that America does can be wrong. And I think that was shaken a little bit by, I mean, protest movements from the Vietnam War through to the Iraq War. Um, but yeah, fun, fundamentally, America sees itself in black and white more than I think the UK does. The UK has um, quite a healthy contempt for government and, and quite a sort of self-deprecating idea of itself. If, if you were sort of characterizing, do you think that's right? Like in terms of the national characters, I think we we really veer around an awful lot. I think on the one hand, we tell an underdog story about ourselves, but that's also central to our idea of supremacy. Mm -hmm. How did this little island rule the waves? It's that contradiction in one mm. nugget. Yeah, we we yearn for the days of empire while also rolling our eyes at everything we do. I think I think that's. Not a terrible way to be. I mean, you, you you talked about being the Guardian's de facto mass shooter correspondent. Um, how how much of um, I guess those mass shooter manifestos do you see being lifted from online discourses? All of them, word for word. I mean, the I the way I first got to the QAnon story was I'd written a piece about HN, which was the place where QAnon was living, essentially. Um, which was where, in very quick succession, the El Paso shooter and the mm. Christchurch shooter had both posted their manifestos. And those two things happened within days of each other, right? Mm. Um, and the manifestos are always the same. They're, they have the same grievances. They use the same sources. Sometimes they just feel like they've just been lifted from each other. And that's because there is this culture where the same ideas are being recycled and people just amalgamate them. And you you do get these people who for whom the grievance becomes so powerful um, that it leads to violence. And then you have the separate question, which is that America is a gun culture, which makes doing that kind of thing very easy. I mean, both in the UK and New Zealand's case, after Christchurch and um, Dunblane. Dunblane. Yeah, I keep wanting to say Lockerbie. You know, so that, that's something else. Yeah, the other terrible um, thing that happened in Scotland. Right. Banned guns, mm. right? And once the ability to do that um, goes, which isn't to say that you don't get kind of these um, horrible events occurring in different ways, but it's the availability of these weapons of war that makes them such a kind of ongoing thing for the for the US. And people, I think it's also more complicated than simply blaming the NRA. Mm. The NRA is obviously very powerful, a lot of influence on American politicians. It's not in, it's not one of the highest kind of lobbying money things. The, fundamentally, the American problem with guns is because it's popular. Mm. It, it's not a lobbying outfit that has huge control. And that is sort of a conspiratorial thinking thing mm. in itself, right? You, people talk about the NRA like it's this spider with its you know tendrils everywhere and, and politicians in their pocket. Their lobbying spend is not huge. Guns play really well in um and what do you think South. that's about? Is it about the kind of like frontier story? Yeah, is it about masculinity? It's it's about the the image of America as this kind of wild west frontier, you know, get off my land um, concept. Oh yeah, the get off my property is such yeah. an American phrase. Yeah, I, I would never dream of uttering get off of my property. Yeah, I'd be like, I'm I mean, renting. The the UK also has that if you like want to build a railway anywhere near people's like, like <laughs> but yeah in the uk it sort of comes out as as this oh yeah but that's nimbyism. always articulated through noise complaints yeah noise pa it's passive aggressive versus yeah, yeah. aggressively ag uh, aggressive right america would just shoot you if you get on their land yeah we just curse roll, and twitch and then right, call the police right to the yeah call the police or like right to the council 50 yeah. times oh in three to five working days you're in <laughs> trouble <laughs> yeah, buddy. yeah 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 you're getting a ticket um but that's certainly better than Shooting, well, it? yeah. I mean, I was going to ask, like, emotionally, what's it like being in the immediate aftermath of a mass shooting and having to read the manifestos, talk to people? Emotionally, what kind of effect does that have? You kind of become, I think, um, hardened to it. Partly because the most depressing thing about it is also the thing that that 
becomes rote, right? It's how much the same thing happens over and over again, how little new to say there is. The way I covered them kind of evolved over the course of that year because at first the instinct for any news desk is what the hell happened, who is this person, you know, you profile the shooter. It was actually that we sort of evolved in what we felt was best practice in that we now, if I was covering that now, I think, you know, you don't use the shooter's name. You don't in any way quote from the manifesto. You don't allow them to have been successful in putting this message out. Mm. Um, but yeah, a lot of the time you're running on automatic because you, I could, you know, you can write the piece in their sleep, like five dead and school shooting, uh, posters manifesto on HN, um, shooter was killed on the scene. Um, it's, it's, such a regular occurrence that that that's just the same facts each time. So I, I, in the end, I sort of was like, I can't mm. do this anymore because it's the same. And I got to the point where I was like, also, it's not going to change. None of this. There's always the same, oh, this is going to be the moment where gun control happens. And it isn't. It's baked in. Mm. This is the price America has decided to pay for that kind of culture of get off my land freedom. And it's done. And I don't see that changing really anytime soon. If after, if there was a really good, um, I can't believe I'm about to say, um, it's the, the Telegraph writer, um, did a tweet after the Sandy Hook that was like, if America looks at the killing of, was it 26 um, mm. school children and says, okay, then done. That's that was it. That was going to be the moment, and it was. I believe wasn't. it was Dan Hodges. Dan Hodges, yeah. He tweeted that. Yeah, yeah. Shout, oh, shout out Dan. The Mail on Sunday. Yeah. He does occasionally say some really insightful he things. He was absolutely right about this. Like once, once that happened, and America didn't do anything, there is no. Why would anything be different when that happens again and again and again? I mean, I guess one of the things we're talking about is how the same dynamics replay again and again. So this feeling of protagonist syndrome mm -hmm. almost and wanting a sense of a mission and agency of fame and of purpose and notoriety that there are all of these kind of um, emotional forces which cluster around 8chan and 4chan and then explode in the form of QAnon or a mass shooting what is the next QAnon that we should be looking out for? Do you see any rumblings of the next thing that could be, um, you know, a, a huge, almost epoch-defining conspiracy theory? You you do sort of get the the flip side of that protagonist syndrome is the NPC thing. Mm -hmm. the, the the people will talk about other people as if they're not human and anything that sort of dehumanizes people or allows for dehumanizing people in that way i mean this is the elon musk thing like mm. grimes in an interview was saying that her and elon kind of seriously discussed the idea that she was created in a virtual reality to be the perfect helpmate for him which i was like Fundamental. i mean wow i was like spit in the eye of second wave feminism why don't you like i don't have interiority of my own i was just here to serve a man mm. but this idea of npcs becoming increasingly prevalent amongst like silicon valley culture that's a good sign right billionaires not thinking that anyone else is human yeah i mean this is the um the thing you get i mean elon musk is sort of a separate thing because that's the thing you get where you get so much money that your brain is completely fried and you have no idea what you're doing the NPC thing is being blended into the um, the already extant QAnon. The thing with QAnon, right, is it's sort of a blob that absorbs everything else. And now it's it's not just a conspiracy ecosystem. It's kind of the political mainstream on the right mm. in the US. Um, again, Marjorie Taylor Greene sitting in the speaker's chair. I think the problem is less a new conspiracy coming along and just QAnon continuing to grow and become almost a mainstream political opinion, which is well on the way to, to doing so. And that's a real problem because, I mean, actually, frankly, we've ha we've seen a QAnon president. That's, that's the Trump administration. The next president of the United States from the Republican Party um, will only be able to get there if they pay lip service to this ecosystem. Otherwise, all the MAGA people won't vote for them. 
And so you get it. It's now out of the phase of kind of spreading and and it's evolving into a phase of almost consolidating its own power. There almost isn't room for another conspiracy theory while QAnon is still expanding because a new conspiracy idea will simply absorb into the whole. So I don't see a new one on the horizon so much as this one continuing to, to expand and dominate. And in terms of how um, the mainstream of the Republican Party is adapting to it, I mean, obviously Marjorie Taylor Greene is a really high profile individual, but, you know, everyone's talking about Ron DeSantis. Is mm. that the more frightening bit that you've got someone who can do the whole corporate Republican thing while at the same time um, playing to MAGA and um, playing to uh, anti groomer moral panics yeah. and that kind of thing? It sort of goes both ways. So I think the way the next kind of Republican primary plays out, it's going to be so interesting to watch because either that's possible or it isn't. Either DeSantis can thread that needle, keep the MAGA side on base, keep Trump on side. And I think Trump isn't going to run personally. I think Trump wants to be the kind of kingmaker, mm. doesn't want to get down in the mud with someone like DeSantis. But DeSantis also needs to keep the kind of corporate side of the Republican Party on side. So... Best case scenario, the Republican Party just rips itself to shreds. Um, worst case scenario, he manages to do that um, and then owes both sides by the time mm. he gets into the White House. Right. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. This uh, is great. Where can people find you? So I'm on Twitter at Nikki Wolf, um, and the podcast is uh, called The Sound Mystery of Havana Syndrome. Mm-hmm. Um our SEO on that is really frustrating because loads of people have done a single episode. So that's if people search the full name of that wherever you get your podcast, you won't get like 15 <laughs> things on Havana Syndrome. Um, and Finding Q is available on Audible if you search for Finding Q. Um, that's also available. That's also available yeah. and also really good. Thank you. <laughs>